Hello and welcome to Your Money, Your Call for another great roundup of all that's property. Now, whether you're a new investor or an experienced one, I guarantee you'll find something on the show tonight which interests you. I'm Margaret Lomas from Destiny Financial Solutions and as well as a range of discussion topics, we'll be answering your questions. And so that you can get those answers from an expert, I've asked into the studio tonight Noel Petrahilos from BMT Tax Depreciation and Brad Matthews from ResCom, who's coming to us from Melbourne this evening. So you're now invited to contact us at any time during the show with your comments and your questions. And you can do that three ways, by calling us right now on 1330 3435, by tweeting me at Margaret Lomas AU, making sure that you use the hashtag YMYC, or by emailing me now at property at skynews.com.au. Welcome to the program tonight and let's go to our first news story. Research from Mortgage Choice has revealed 54.6% or 45.6% of Australian property investors plan to keep their property for 10 years or longer. Mortgage Choice Chief Executive John Flavelle said the research demonstrated many property investors understood the wisdom behind a long-term strategy. Flavelle cautioned potential investors that it could take some time Time to see significant value growth. His comments were supported by CoreLogic's pain and gain report, which showed that houses resold out of profit were typically held for 9.1 years, while apartments resold out of profit were held for 7.6 years. By contrast, houses sold at a loss had typically been held for 6.3 years, while apartments resold at a loss had been held for 6.9 years. Noel, welcome to the program. Thanks, Margaret. So, interesting um, to note Very interesting, yeah. that. W what are your comments on that? I was really excited when I saw that article because I, I, I worry sometimes when you've got some of these, these new generations coming through, especially the, the millennials, and they're, and they're talking very short term when they talk about property. And, and talking to clients when you're usually dealing with that, that younger generation, you hear about them, you know, a 12 month and an 18 month and a three year even strategy and it really scares me. And I, and I think I, I was really excited to see that the survey showed that that longer than 10 years and, and even more interested, and I know it's a number that's across the board, but to, to nine years to be getting uh, a profit out of property across the board is a really good number to see. Um, it goes to show that, you know, that, that there's time in the market. Now, we all know about market timing but, but you know, you, you really, if you do your research, and some people have been very lucky in particular areas, um, but in, in my mind, because of the, the, the way that you're the, the costs of buying into property and then getting out of property, it's always got to be a long-term thing. And, and really, you should be thinking about leveraging in and out of property rather than so much buying and holding for a short period of time and selling. Mm. Um, but look, it was it, it's some interesting numbers. Um, th these these long-term trends are important, and, and, and I think, for the young people coming through to see stuff like that, I think it's promising considering that you get that feeling of instant gratification that you see um, in, in a lot of other types of investments. But to, to see a survey result like this, I think it's really good. Uh, Brad, you're down in Melbourne. Welcome to the program tonight. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Brad, one of the things that concerns me, though, about this is that we still need to be able to differentiate between the property that grows nicely over a nine-year period and the property that needs nine years to start to show a profit because some spruikers sold it to you um, and made more money out of it than you can. But that's that's always going to be a problem. It's been there since uh, Adam was a boy. There's, there's spruikers or crooks, whichever way you want to look at them. And regardless um, of what happens in the property market, if you buy a property from somebody like that, um, you're always going to be so far behind the eight ball and all you're doing is actually catching up. You're actually not getting in front, you're catching up. Mm. Yeah, so, so I really want to warn people that, you know, there are definitely uh, spruikers out there who tell you that you have to have 10 years in the market. But what we really need to see, Brad, is at the end of that nine years, we need to see a return that's significantly better than what our money could have made for us invested in something else or left in the bank. Mm. Yeah. The, yep. the problem with it is, though, if, if they're buying the wrong property to start with, they're probably never going to catch up. If they catch up, it's only catching up through artificial means, not because the property was good. 
So yeah. you know, the research, it's all about the research to start with rather than, okay, I've got my property, therefore I know in 9, 10, 12 years, I know that I will have doubled or a little mm. bit more than my money because the market has gone up. Yeah, so if, absolutely. If you're buying the right property to start with, you're going to be in front of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly we're here to tell you how to find that right property. And um, Noel, I want to come back to you after we take this next caller because I do want to talk about uh, a little bit about the depreciation, the plan and equipment depreciation in the context of holding a property for 10 years. But let's yeah. go to the phones now. And Stuart from Sydney, you're on the line. How can we help you, Stuart? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just looking at, um, for instance, CBD, like property unit prices being at a 17-year low. Um, I've been looking at like around Central Station, like from Ann Street through to Queen Street. Yeah. Um, and I've seen property ranging from the low threes to early fours and um, from two betters. So I was interested in picking up maybe some of those properties or am I a little bit too early? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Noel, I, um, as you know, b before this program I was on Switzer and one of the things that we did talk about was apartment living in Brisbane and whether or not buying apartments in Brisbane is a good idea. Uh, what are your thoughts? Look, I, I'm... Brisbane's a, a funny market for apartments. I think, right, there's, there's, there's pockets in, in Brisbane that we all know of. There's been a lot of buildings going up, a lot of residential buildings going up, and I think you've just got to be really careful um, with, with the potential of oversupply because there, there, there has been a lot of uh, apartments released. Now, that can sometimes present opportunity. As Stuart's pointed out there, um, you know, the, 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 the entry price is quite low, um, but what you've got to look at there is what are the long-term fundamentals with that investment? Where, you know, yeah. what, what, what are the yields and, and um, you know, the, the, the vacancy rate? And I'd be checking a little bit more into that before I'd go and jump into an apartment right in the CBD. Um, I'd be looking a little bit further out of the CBD. Um, a couple of those areas that are, you know, within the, the middle ring, um, you know, and, and, and even looking at apartments specifically is not always the best option or not always the best to have a preconceived idea of the type of property you want to buy. Um, but if you're looking at a particular type of property in a particular area, I think you've got to broaden your horizon a little bit than just saying apartments, Brisbane CBD at the moment. Mm. Uh, Brad, uh, down, down there in Melbourne, we're conscious that you're all the way down there in Melbourne. Brad, there's a lot of pain in the Melbourne market at the moment and it's only just begun because of the oversupply there. What's your impression of the Brisbane market for apartments? Um, Look, continuing on what Noel, Noel said, I'm in agreement, um, but it, it's based on more along the lines if you've got to think of what you're actually buying um, and why you're buying. If you're buying an investment, then for Stuart's perspective, you've got to look at why are you buying that investment? Is it for, you know, potentially to live in it at a later date? Is it for purely for capital growth and returns? Because you then need to go and not just look at the um, the website for what this property is, but then have a look at these apartments that are ranged between 300 to 400 and then have a look around them because there's no point really buying, you know, a, an apartment on the 8th or the 15th or the 30th floor if the, you know, car yard or the car park next door to it at some point in the future is going to be built up. Um, you've just got to keep looking at the fundamentals as to why you buy. Um, I find that a lot of the people who buy that inner CBD within a couple of kilometres are generally either overseas investors uh, or uh, locals that have been sold something by, we'll use the, the term the spruker, um, you have to look and see where is the wider market and the wider market for buyers is not in that CBD. Mm, absolutely. Look, um, and if you can, if you can rewind, um, call it while... while you know, after I've answered the question, we did talk about this on Switzer. The biggest problem in the Brisbane CBD is there is an oversupply, for starters. It's mainly in South Bank and the West End, but there's a fair amount there around Ann Street, and a lot of those are given over to service departments as well, remember that. Now, the other problem becomes that the people of Brisbane aren't quite as ready to embrace that in a city urban living as they are in Melbourne and Sydney, and it's mostly because they don't need to yet. They don't have the undersupply of property and the unaffordability of property in the rest of, of the city that they do have in Sydney and Melbourne and therefore people don't embrace them quite so much. But the last thing that I want to say is that you shouldn't be buying an apartment just because it seems like the cheaper option unless you can mm. actually demonstrate a strong demand for that particular property type. So find out what the vacancy rates are like. Is there a significant demand for people renting them 
Because if there isn't, remember, whenever you buy in a fairly big block of apartments, there's another 60 or 80 or 100 apartments just like yours. That affects your ability to rent it and that also affects your ability to sell it when the time comes to sell. So be very, very careful with this one. Maybe go five, 10 kilometres out of the CBD and if you still want to get an apartment, there are certainly plenty of places around Brisbane where apartment living in those small six and eight packs of apartments, they're well priced, they get a good return and they're still close enough to the city. Now, Alan's question is right up Brad's alley and he asks, Hi, Margaret, I've heard that the reduction in plot ratios for apartments in Melbourne has meant that the supply has been slowed with some developments delayed. Do you think this is true? If so, is the reduction in supply significant enough to improve the apartment situation? How far does this oversupply reach? Is there a distance from the CBD that may not be as affected by increasing supply? Looking at Heidelberg West, it appears that it has been the poor cousin compared to its neighbouring suburbs like Ivanhoe. It looks like it will benefit from improvements as part of work around the Latrobe National Employment and Innovation Cluster. Do you see this suburb's apartment values or house values making up any of the gap to its neighbours? Okay, so Brad, just start with the first part of the question, which is essentially about the oversupply in Melbourne. Does the reduction in plot ratios impact on this, do you think? Um, I don't think it, it impacts that much as um, you would expect, Margaret, because there is a hell of a lot of apartments that have already been approved, so their permits are still sitting in place under the old regime. There's still a, a whole lot of apartments that are being built and there's uh, under the old permits uh, and there's still a whole lot of apartments that are still, uh, they're still there that have been finished. Um, so I don't know that it's going to change anything as much. Maybe in three to four to five years' time, yes, it'll have changed a lot uh, adversely for those owners uh, that had land because potential buyers now will not pay as much for those vacant blocks or those potential development sites in the CBD. Uh, and, it, and it mainly affected the, the sites in the, in the CBD where you could get really, really high density. So it was always an issue in the outer suburbs or even, even the inner suburbs. It was mainly the CBD that was affected when the planning minister, he just bought it in virtually overnight um, with not even a, you know, a buy your leave uh, and said, right, this is now the new plot ratios that will apply. Uh, whereas in the past, you virtually had to do it on a case by case basis uh, and you could really increase the yield on the apartments that you could build on a small block of land. Mm. And what do you think about Heidelberg for a place to invest? And would you buy an apartment um, there? I actually like what Alan put down there. It has always been seen as the poor cousin um, to the more affluent areas <laughs> that surround it, such as uh, Eaglemont and, and Ivanhoe. Um, some really excellent buying would have happened you know, there over the last, say, previous three through to the last five, six, seven years. Um, because you know the the smarter developers would see what's happening in the neighbouring suburbs and say at some point it is going to trickle down to Heidelberg or Heidelberg West. It's got fantastic uh, train services there. It's got um, hospital and education facilities that are very very good. So it's, it was always going to be that next one that would take off. Mm. Um, as to buying there, I don't know that you've necessarily missed the boat, um, but now the land is, is a very, very high price um, compared to the suburbs surrounding, though it is still a lower price. Mm. Uh, but it comes back to looking at what you're actually going to, to buy in there rather than just saying, you know, one, one thing fits all. Uh, you actually still have to look at what you're buying. Mm. Well, there you have it straight from the horse's mouth. Well, it's good to have you on board for the show tonight. If you do have a question or a comment and you also want to be in the running to win a copy of one of my books, then get to the phones, the email or even to Twitter with your question. Tonight, anyone who calls, emails or tweets a question and has it answered on the show will receive a copy of one of my book. Now, this week it's Investing in the Right Property Now, selling in your bookshop for $30 and a great book to teach you all about those growth drivers that we've already discussed this evening. Call us on 1300 30 34 30 Tweet me at Margaret Lomas AU with the hashtag YMYC or email property at skynews.com.au with your question. And then make sure that you do watch at the end of the show to see how to get hold of your copy. It's time now for us to take a short break. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll be answering questions from the phones, emails and Twitter. We'll be right back here soon with more.
it's great to see you here on Sky News Money tonight. Noel Petrohilos from BMT Tax Depreciation and Brad Matthews from Rescom are standing by to take your calls. Now, to have yours answered and get a free copy of one of my books, call us now on 1330 3435. Tweet me on Margaret Lomas AU with the hashtag YMYC or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Adam, you're from Victoria. How are you doing? Hello, Princess Margaret. I think you should be promoted to Queen Margaret. <laughs> you know what? We've talked about that and I said yeah. Queen's okay, but I like being a princess because, you know, it's got that inference that I'm younger. Yeah, I mean, well, you, we know what happened to Mary Antoinette, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I then. Mean, You're not suggesting I should have my head chopped off, are you? No, 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 no. This is... I mean, Brad's from uh, Victoria... Oh, I mean, that, that little young Adam who grew up, was that Adam who eventually married Eve? <laughs> so what's your question then, Adam? The, the question, look, I was driving, I was up Beechworth uh, area on um, yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, driving to Brighton, uh, up to Mount Hotham. And, uh, I mean, it's such a beautiful area. Mm. I mean, the radio the whole time too was trying to convince us to say, Adam should marry Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, guys, just thoughts on that uh, total area as an investment. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, now, Noel, I don't know if you've ever been to Bright, but it's very really no. pretty. It's very, very pretty, it, but it is a town. It is a town, and, and I, I, love, like, I, there's, I don't know the area, and I'll go across to Brad because he's a, he's a Victorian and knows, the, uh, knows those areas really well, but I just get a bit of a fright when I hear someone who goes to a particular area and they're driving through and they see all this beautiful scenic countryside and they think, you know what, I'm going to invest here just because a place is picturesque, <laughs> looks beautiful, <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty and, and, um, and you have an amazing experience there and it's great for a holiday doesn't necessarily mean that it's got the right drivers there for an investment and that property values are going to grow. You're in it for the long term, as we saw in that article before, but you're, you're also in it for capital growth. And, um, and look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those areas, but if, uh, if Adam was driving through and, and was a little bit spellbound by the mountains and the, and the mist in the hills, then I think he, he needs to start looking at a few other of the key metrics and the drivers. So get in there and do some research, Adam. Um, and uh, look, uh, Brad might have a, a bit more information on the on the particular area themselves. So, Brad, now look, Bright is very pretty. I mean, that main road as you drive into town with the trees that meet in the middle and particularly in the autumn when the leaves start to turn nice and gold, it's very picturesque. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really have any significant employment drivers, does it? Here's, here's the thing to look at for, for Adam. Just picture exactly what Margaret said and the segue in was what Noel had said as well, and that is as you drive into that town and it says Bright, just remove the, the name plate for the name Bright, put another one there and it's the same as you know, 150 other beautiful little towns in Victoria and <laughs> yeah. 30 or 40 towns in Tasmania and, you know, 60 or 70, 80 towns just like that in New South Wales. It's got to, if it's going to be an investment, it's got to have a number of key drivers behind it. And as much as I love Bright, its key driver is food and tourism. Mm. Um, and it's not enough to, to sustain a investment property. So you can get a great Absolutely. little bed and breakfast place there, or you can get a, a great little house there, but actually getting something that grows beyond the tourism and the food industry, which you don't control, um, isn't going to help you with an investment property. Mm. You know, Adam, it's what I always tell property investors, and that is that you are actually better off not to look at an area. And it's a little bit like when somebody... Uh, might go blind, for example, and suddenly their hearing gets better and their touch gets better and their taste gets better and they get sharper. If you teach yourself not to look at an area, but instead apply all of those 20 questions and learn about the growth drivers and what makes an area grow, you'll be a better investor and your emotions won't play into things. One of the reasons why we don't suggest small towns is because at best you might get 
some good market timing. It might grow for a little while after you buy it and then it sits flat for a very long time to come. And I say the same things even about even the big cities in Tasmania. We get a little bit of sentiment about it. It has great yields and so investors come rushing in for the cash flows. And for a little while it looks like everybody made the right decision because we see a spike in values. But then we don't have the population growth. We don't have the diversity of industry and we don't have the future infrastructure to keep that rolling on like a steamroller. And that's what needs to happen in an area that's going to grow. It must grow for you year in, year out for a significant period of time so that you get enough money there in equity to be able to buy more properties and build a true portfolio. In an area like Bright, gorgeous as it is, so please, people of Bright, don't send me emails. I love Bright. I just wouldn't choose it as a property investment to make me some decent money over the long term. Well, we have another caller, I think. Daniel from Sydney. Daniel, how are you going? Are you still there, Daniel? All right, well, let's try and get Daniel back and we'll go straight to our email. And it says, hi, Margaret, thanks for your show. It's very informative. And we have a question on scrapping. We had a depreciation schedule done seven years yeah, ago. Yeah, I can you, hear you. You'll, oh, <laughs> okay. I'm actually reading an email now. How are you going? <laughs> Sorry. That's all right, Daniel. What are you doing there, Daniel? Well, I, I thought you could hear me. I could hear you guys. I could hear you guys <laughs> in the break as well. Anyway. Okay, oh, well, wow. <laughs> we've got you now. What's your yeah. question? Um, I was just uh, about to say I watch your show uh, every week. Uh, and every time you discuss something that makes me a bit edgy, I call you up and you reassure me. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm what gonna are you edgy again. about tonight, Daniel? <laughs> well, um, I bought I bought two years ago in Marsfield um, for six hundred thousand, and it's about six hundred seventy or six hundred eighty thousand now. Um, so that's been pretty good, and it's it's a good area. But I'm just thinking with the Sydney market where it is, and Labor getting into power and them chopping negative gearing, have I sort of maybe put myself behind the eight ball for the next 10 years? I'm 31, so I plan on living for a long time. But um, I obviously I'm, I'm not going to sell it, but have I sort of maybe not made the best um, decision for my first property? Can Just in terms me... of that gross... Uh, yeah, yeah. Go on. Can you tell me, Daniel, do you have some equity tied up in that property? Do I have equity tied up? Yeah, so do you have some equity in there? So do you... Oh, yeah, yeah, my loan's about 550000 okay. Um and I've just secured a fixed rate of 3.88% and I intend to put $40,000 in the... to pay down the principal because I've got no other debts. So, okay. Um, Okay, so maybe not enough equity to leverage against to buy another property yet, Noel. Um, what do you think? I guess even if, you see, the problem, of course, is even if it does sit flat now, selling it is just not is just going to exacerbate the problem. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the, I guess the problem is that Sydney's had that, that really good um, uh, bit of growth for the last five years, and, and Sydney's in a fantastic market, but the problem with it is, is that it spikes and then plateaus and spikes and plateaus, and it tends to follow that trend. It doesn't tick away like some of the other areas. Um, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I think, Daniel, you might be being, be being a little bit hard on yourself. Um, the fact that you bought a, a couple of years ago in, in some of those uh, those areas is is quite a good. It hasn't probably performed as well as some of the other areas around Sydney in the last two years. Um, and look, I wouldn't be. Um, as, as the article we talked, and I keep referring back to it, um, you've got to be in it for the long term. Um, I wouldn't be looking for something in the next two to three years. I think you're going to have to sit there and wait it out. But getting out of that property now is going to cost you and then getting into another property is going to cost you. Um, what I'd probably do is, and, and look, you don't have a whole heap of equity there, probably not enough to, to secure or use as security for another property. But start, you know, go, go get some advice and start doing some research and hopefully you can, um, you might have some savings or there's, there's an area that, um, you can focus on on investing to try and, you know, and it might be just a, a matter of budgeting um, to try and um, fund your way into another property. I'd be probably looking at a lower entry price as the kind of stuff that I look at. Um, and, and, and then you can potentially diversify a little bit more and buy in a couple of different markets as opposed to throwing six, seven hundred thousand dollars at one market 
looking at that three to four hundred thousand in a couple of markets and look as much as um, some of the smaller areas we talked about the really small areas the small towns there's there's a, there are a dime a dozen um, if you go to the more regional areas um, like Wollongong and Newcastle you can get some really good bargains around around there for that price range mm. look uh, just quickly Daniel here's the thing for you um, you can't really get out because the selling costs and then rebuying again is going to eat up any of that equity and you won't be able to even get an 80% loan unless you go really low for a cheaper property but here is something to think about at 670 it is now a significantly cheaper property in Sydney than most so it is now at that bottom in the bottom third of the market for buy-in you can't really get much for under 600,000 anywhere in all of Sydney what this means is that as the other properties remain unaffordable at least you'll get more people looking in your market I don't think the market that you're in will suffer quite as much as some of those higher markets will so sit on it for now you probably will see a little bit more growth in your market a little better than most and then give it a year or two when you come off your fixed rate have another look at it then get some good advice as Noel says in the meantime learn how to become a really good investor so that next time you don't make a mistake it's time for us to pop off for just another quick break, but we will be back soon. If you do have a question for us and you'd like an answer, plus a free copy of my book, Investing in the Right Property Now, call us now on 1300 30 Tweet me to Margaret Lomas AU with the hashtag YMYC or email property at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back, so stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in tonight for our property edition of Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas from Destiny. Tonight, Noel Petro, Pet, very hard name to say, Petrohelos from BMT Tax Depreciation and Brad Matthews from Rescom are joining me to take your questions. So call us now on 1300 30 Tweet Margaret Lomas AU with the hashtag YMYC or you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Now in other news tonight, the Victorian stamp duty has been abolished for first home buyers purchasing a property valued below $600,000. From July, discounts are now also available for property purchases between $600,000 and $750,000 on a sliding scale, regardless of whether they're new or established homes. As part of these sweeping changes, the Victorian government also recently passed legislation which amended the off-the-plan concession so that it can only apply when off-the-plan property less than 550000 is being used as a principal place of residence or for first-home buyers of off-the-plan up to 600000 The implementation of these changes means that the off-the-plan concession will no longer be available for any other acquisitions pursuant to off-the-plan contracts, whether they're for residential or investment purposes. As part of a suite of changes to make housing more affordable, the government introduced a new tax levied at 1% on vacant residential property to target empty properties in Melbourne's inner and middle suburbs. Owners will be encouraged to make vacant properties eligible for purchase or rent. Well, Brad, there's certainly been a lot of big changes down there in, in Victoria. Yes, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think there was an election coming up soon, would you? <laughs> so, what does it all mean? Um, I think it's a continuation of, uh, doesn't matter whether it's left wing, right, right wing, liberal, labour, they all want a money grab. Um, unfortunately, too many politicians, uh, instead of balancing their books, uh, and reducing expenditure, they look at increasing their income, which is generally taxation, rather than uh, decreasing their expenditure. So in this case, uh, you've got state government looking and saying, well, we'll put taxes up because we want more money, rather than looking at methods to, to balance their books or reduce, reduce their spending. Mm. Well, I'm not quite as cynical as you. Um, I'm trying to see this as a positive thing. And th there's certainly some benefits there for first home buyers, which is good news. And taking away the stamp duty exemption for off the plan purchases will certainly help to take that heat out of that market with too many investors buying too many apartments, won't it? Um, but then you look at it and it wasn't necessarily the investors um, that were getting all the benefits before. So you still had first home buyers who were probably not even in that market buying apartments because if they're a first home buyer and they're buying an apartment off the plan, generally the settlement is two to three years away. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah So sure. they weren't really getting that benefit. I think that there are other ways to, to ease the property uh, 
increasing in value by so much, and that's to increase supply rather than tighten up the demand, which is what they're going to do again now. A lot of developments won't happen, which means that demand uh, will still be there because people still want to buy. Interest rates are still at low, low levels, um, but the supply side of it will diminish. Mm. Well, it could be a good thing for apartments in Melbourne, but not so much for properties, uh, houses and, and things like that. Well, look, let's go to our emails now. And here's a question for Noel. And it says, hi, Margaret. Thanks for your show. It's very informative. We have a question on scrapping. We had a depreciation schedule done seven years ago. We're about to demolish the property this year. Can we claim the remaining amount on the schedule? That is the amount not yet depreciated. Is it the same for the capital works component? Also, is the ability to claim depending on whether the property continues to be rented out or not, therefore, if it becomes a place, principal place of residence? Well, no, be careful because the tax office watches this show. I so can answer this be, question with one word. Don't be giving word. any do dodgy advice. Well, two words. No, I, well, the ATO do watch. They call in every now and again. They do, they read. So does um, the Prime Minister, but yeah. He, so they does Scott disguise, Morrison, doesn't he? They disguise themselves. Yeah, yeah they use fake names. <laughs> the, the simple answer is scrapping yes. Um, you can, if, if you are demolishing that building to, to build a primary place of residence that you're going to move into, no, you can't. Um, and you really need to be careful there. Um, scrapping, now there are two components to depreciation. There's your building right off for your structural element of the building and your plant and equipment. You can actually scrap both the structural element of the building as long as it qualifies. Now for it to qualify, the building needs to be built after 1985. So if the building was built after 1985, which not a lot, lot of buildings in that era, era are getting knocked down, if it qualifies for that 2.5% per year for 40 years, and look, let's just say it was seven years old and you bought it when you bought it seven years ago, there's still that 33 years and, and the majority of the claim left on that building write-off that you'll be able to write off 100%, as long as you're replacing it with another investment property. Now, the plant and equipment side of thing, that's all the assets that depreciate quicker than the building itself. So that's your carpet, blinds, light fittings, um, hot water system, stove. As those asset, assets are ripped out and scrapped, you can claim whatever's left on, on those assets as well. Keeping in mind, you've obviously had a depreciation schedule prepared seven years ago, so there won't be a whole heap left. Um, a, a lot of the assets um, have an effective life of you know, somewhere between three and 12 years, the majority of them, under a diminishing value method, which is the method that most people use, or they might allocate a low value pooling system, which means you can accelerate the rate of depreciation, claiming more of that plants and equipment in those first five years. If you've had the right depreciation schedule and the right advice, most of that value in those plants and equipment assets would be written off already. Therefore, the scrapping side on the plants and equipment, there wouldn't be a whole heap left on it. And I guess the critical thing here, of course, Noel, is that it's unlikely that the property is going to be uh, demolished if it was built after that critical 1987 you date. Don't, you don't see it so very it's often. What, yeah. 30 years? Although, yeah, look, I suppose if it was a really lousy built, lousily built home, maybe, but it's more likely that someone with a house that's 30 years or less isn't going to demolish that property. No, because that, that era property says they were really, they were really, they were well, really well built, built weren't they? Um, yeah. and, and you, you rarely see that happen. Look, it, it does happen, and I've seen some, some, some big write-offs. Um, you know, that, that capital works component makes up 80% of that, or even, even more, 85 to 90% of that total construction cost. Mm -hmm. So if it does qualify, if it was built after 87 and you're, and you're mm -hmm. leaving that second property as an as a, um, investment property, then definitely talk to a quantity surveyor and get someone in and, and, and or I mean, you've got your depreciation schedule. So whatever's left on that, that building write-off component, and it should be a fairly substantial amount, you can claim the lot. Sounds great. Well, let's go to another email, and John has a question about Hobart. He asks, I'd like to know what the panel thinks of Hobart as a place to invest in the current market. I'm looking to buy an investment house, and the growth and returns seem better in places like Glenorchy and Gage Brook. I have a budget of around 300000 and I'd like the panel's ideas on these areas, please. Let's go to you, Brad, down there in Melbourne, sitting all by yourself in that nice, <laughs> cute little studio down there. Um, Thanks, Hobart, Martin. you know, uh, I have a lot of discord with other property experts over Hobart at the moment. I'd be interested to see what you think. Look, I, I don't know enough about it. I know that it's a lovely place. I've been there a couple of times with my wife. We love to visit. I just don't see enough underlying support there um, to make it something that is going to grow over time. 
it, uh, and I don't know what your view is on it, so I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it out there. Um, the, the prices are low, uh, you know, relative to other capital cities, but there doesn't seem to be enough uh, there to make it grow within its own right. Mm. You know, no, people like to buy in Hobart because, as this gentleman has said, $300,000 buy-in price, and generally the yields are up around 5.5%. Mm. Is that enough to make a good investment? Look, Hobart's performed really well in the last three to five years, and, and, and I'm, I'm with you, Margaret. I was, I was a little bit worried about it um, in that time ago, and, I, and, I, and you saw, um, you know, unemployment was stable, and it seems to be one of those places that ticks away. Um, you, you, the, the population growth was a little concern for me, but then it has performed. Um, you know, you look at some of those suburbs that he's also mentioned when you're going on the outskirts of Hobart, um, where the buy-in price is a little bit lower again um, as you go further away, and, and 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 the rents are still. I mean, they're not they're not astronomical, but they're but they're high, and the yields are going up into the fives and six and seven percents as as you go further out. I, I, I'd be worried about going right to the outskirts, um, and I think he. Um, mentioned Glen, Glen Orchie and, um, and Gage, Gagebrook, and I don't know those areas very well. Some of those, those uh, I guess you could say, more regional style major cities, um, as you get a little bit too far out, you can really, the, 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 the drivers or the key drivers that you're looking for for capital growth are a little bit lost. Um, so I'd be looking in the middle somewhere, and, and again, being, being an area I don't know that well, it's, it's difficult to crystal ball it, but going on historical performance, it, it has ticked away quite well over the last three years. Mm. See, here's the thing. Every now and then Hobart gets that sentimental growth, and the reason it gets it is because it is cheap and it does have good yields. So when everything else goes crazy, then investors scatter about, they start to look for something that they can get a good buy-in price for a cheap price, uh, for a cheap, a good rental return for a cheap price. The next thing that happens is you suddenly get all these come in and you start to get a little bit of a reading on the growth and it looks good and all the experts say, see, yeah, see, I told you that that's what would happen. And then it sits flat for a very long time. And the problem is it has a long period of flatness, just like Sydney does, but at least Sydney has a significant boom before it goes flat. So Sydney will double in value and then go flat for eight to 10 years, sometimes 12 years. That doesn't happen in Hobart and there's a single reason for that. The population grows one quarter the national average and they have a big amount of outward migration. So what we're seeing happening in the short term windows is investor sentiment, but that can't sustain a market. And you're better off getting a market that might grow a little bit less, but grow every year with the potential to keep growing every year. Now, that's just my opinion, but I wouldn't be buying in Hobart right now. And I've been wrong before, but only once. So this could be the second time that I'm going to be wrong. Uh, and if so, then I'm really sorry that I told you not to buy in Hobart. I wouldn't do it. I think you're better off somewhere like Brisbane and Melbourne, not much more expensive. If your price range is 300,000, you'll probably find you can go to 350 or 400. Plenty to buy in Brisbane and Melbourne for, for those prices. Well, thanks for tuning in. It's time for a break, but when we come back, you'll have your last chance to get hold of a copy of my book, Investing in the Right Property Now. To get that, you have to ask a question and we must answer it. Call now on 1300 30 34 35. Tweet Margaret Lomas AU or you can also email us on property at skynews.com.au. We'll see you back here soon with more. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas from Destiny Financial Solutions, and it's been my pleasure tonight to host Noel Petrohelos from BMT Tax Depreciation and Brad Matthews from Rescom. Our lines are closed for tonight, but we do have time for these last questions. Starting with you, Nancy, you're waiting on the line. You've got a question about Kalala Beach. Yeah, yes, I have um, 50 acres at Kalala Beach, oh. but it's Doing fast trains, I don't know how long they will take. Mm. What do you think? Uh, so you've owned that for a while, I guess. Yes. And did you used to live there or did you inherit or something like that? No, we, I bought it and put a holiday house on it. Right. So and I don't know whether it'll, it will go up for development or whether it will go up in value because of the... Fast trains. Mm. Noel, 
I think that fast train is going to be very slow coming. What do you think? I've seen lots and lots of feasibility studies on fast trains, but not a, not a great deal of substance. I wouldn't I wouldn't um, hedge hedge a lot of your bets on the on the fast train. Fifty acres is a is a lovely big big plot of land, and and if if some infrastructure does get put into the area, um, you can put a lot of a lot of lots. Um, you know, depending on what the zoning's like on on fifty acres. Um, fantastic. I, I don't know that area uh, very well, um, but you know, hoping that that you get some better infrastructure to the area and it, and it pays off. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a strange thing to put a lot of money in and a lot of eggs in one basket, in my opinion. Yeah, look, uh, I think, I don't think you should be holding your breath and waiting there and hoping that suddenly Kalala Beach does grow and that you're going to get developers coming in. You're not going to want to develop it. So the option would then be that if there is a lot of infrastructure going in, that a developer will come in and buy it off you. And then that the council will allow that to be subdivided as well. It's presently zoned rural, I'm sure, with 50 acres. Um, so I wouldn't hold my breath. I think it is one of those things where you're not going to make a significant amount of money in the foreseeable future out of that property. But it is a beautiful place. Maybe you just should keep holidaying there. Well, let's go to an email from Noma who asks, Hi panel, I have a property investment in Logan, Queensland and it's in the process of being underpinned. When the property has been fixed, should I sell or keep it? It's caused a lot of trouble in the past financially. Okay, Brad. What do you think? Uh, She's obviously spent money on this property already. There's not enough information there to make a, a real clear-cut uh, recommendation, Margaret, because because there's been problems in the past, is that related to the growth of the property or is it related to, to your tenant? Is it related to the gearing that you went against? it? There's not enough there to be able to say clear-cut just because it's being underpinned and you've had troubles in the past whether they're going to recur. Um, I don't know when you bought it. Um, there's a whole lot of other questions there that need to be asked before you can make that sort of call. Mm. And look, in addition to that, let me point out to you, Noma, that the Logan Shire does have plenty going for it. Mm. And it doesn't matter where in Logan it is, it's got many, many years of growth ahead of it. There's been a lot of beautification, a lot of infrastructure, an awful lot happening in the area. And I think after you spend all that money on it, I certainly wouldn't be getting rid of it now. Hang in there. You say there's problems. It's probably from tenants. You could be in a part of the Logan Shire where there is some struggle with tenants. But that is slowly changing. And I think you can hope for a better future in mm. in the future. We have one final email from Nigel, I think. Can we find that email? Do I have that email available to read? Let me read it to you because I just have to happen to have it here. And it's from Nigel. And Nigel says... If I scroll back up, I'm supposed to be able to find it. Here we go. I'm looking to invest in my first home in Victoria. If I purchase something with over 600 square metres and want to demolish and subdivide immediately rather than living in the home for the six-month period, am I still eligible for the first home buyer's grant stamp duty exemption? Noel, what do you think? Look, I'm, I'm not as familiar with a first home buyer's uh, situation in Victoria, but my feeling is that that scenario shouldn't affect it. Um, they're going in and buying a property and, and to build. Um, they should be eligible for that grant. I, I, I can't see any reason why the subdivision or, um, or, or the fact that it's a knockdown and rebuild, it still applies to that first home buyer's grant as far as I know. And is that how you understand it too, Brad? 50-50 um, because the stamp duty exemption should be there but the grant in the past, and I haven't looked at the new issues relating to but the grant in the past has required you to live there for 12 months um, afterwards. So you have to be a first home buyer with the intention and there are, you know, there's a little asterisk there that, you know, there are some exemptions you can get by, i.e. if you get transferred mm -hmm. for work or if you, you, you may be in a marital split up or something like that. But generally, they're, what they're looking for is that you live in the home for at least 12 months uh, mm. and you get the, you're, you're still entitled to the grant because the, the grant is paid to you up front uh, at settlement of the, 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 the home. Yeah. The stamp duty, I don't, I don't think that that's, I think that's a difficult one to police after the event. Um, but you, you go straight into the state revenue office, you get the name, the identity of whoever it is, and you ask them to confirm for you what the actual status is before you make that decision.
mm. on that particular scenario. Yeah, yeah. And look, let me just clarify that about that 12 months. The rule is actually that you have to live in it for a period of time. It's not, the period of time isn't um, clarified sometime within the first 12 months. So you have to move in, even if it's moving on day 364, you have to have the intention to live in it as your own home and you have to move in within that first 12 months and you, it, you can live in it. The, the, the Office of State Revenue don't actually say how long for. Um, some people live in for one month and have a change of mind and then move out for some reason. So long as they bona fide got that grant because they intended it to be their principal place of residence, they can keep it. So I'm of the opinion that you probably can, you know, you say you're going to start, you're going to demolish it. Why not just settle on it, live in, it, move in, start working on your plans, then demolish and build, and then you've got no problems whatsoever because you have set it up as your bona fide principal place of residence. But I'm of the opinion, and check with the, the Office of State Revenue that even if you did demolish it straight away and then built something, as long as you lived in it, then that. Stamp um, that um, grant should still apply. Well, that's a wrap for this week. Be sure to still tune in next week when Ian Rodriguez and Ben Kingsley join me to answer all of your questions. Be sure to get your tax and property investment le legislation questions to me through the week for that show. Thanks go to Brad and Noel for helping me tonight, and I'll be back again later in the year. Thanks also to our callers. If we answered your question tonight, email me now on yourmoneyyourcalladestiny.com.au. Tell me which question was yours. Provide your mailing address and I'll send you your book. Don't forget to pop along to my website, destiny.com.au, where you'll find tons of free educational content for you to download. This week, my video blog is about the power of your capital. Just go to the homepage where you can download my vidcasts and podcasts for free or go to iTunes for the free podcast subscription. Thanks so much for being with us. I'll see you right back here again next week. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.